name's Sue, and I was introduced by, um, by Elena and by Lynn. So I've known Lynn for some years now. And um, just to thank Andy for inviting me to talk today, it's maybe going to take about 25 minutes, 30 minutes. And it's basically my story of overcoming some really serious illness that you would never guess I've had. But I guess there are lots of people in my situation. So this is just to summarise what my life is around right now. I had a chat with Lynn who suggested how to do this presentation. And she thought, just kind of say, this is my life now. So. Um, I'm a musician, and when I was eight, uh, I asked my parents for a violin, and I learned to play in orchestras and classical concertos and play string quartets. And then you know what it's like if you're watching the telly or listening to the radio, and then all of a sudden you hear someone sing or someone playing a guitar, and just at that moment it does something for you, and you say, I would give my life to be able to do that. So I've had this experience maybe three or four times. And the first time was um, back, I guess, about 15, 20 years ago, with a river dance and a guy that was playing the inland pipes, those really gorgeous Irish pipes. And I, I just became completely obsessed with Irish music. So that picture top right is about, is an Irish session. And then a bit later, I discovered a guy called Stefan Grappelli who was this amazing violinist that never had to practice. And I had to tell you I do. <laughs> I had to practice really hard to get good at things. He never used to practice. He just used to surround himself um, with guys that were amazing jazz players. And there was a guy called Django Reinhardt that burned his hand in a caravan fire, who was a gypsy. And Stefan Grappelli and Django Reinhardt became this really famous duet, and they became a kind of national symbol in France during the Second World War. And so that picture, top left, is, is a, a kind of caricature of Grappelli and Django Reinhardt. And then I had to learn how to do that. And then more recently, um, a friend introduced me, the friend was Jewish, and she introduced me to this music called Klezma. And Klezma is Eastern European Jewish wedding music. So the closest, if no, if no one's ever heard this, the closest thing I can describe is Fiddler on the Roof. And I heard this clarinetist play klezmer, and my mouth just fell open, and I just had to learn how to do it. So, so that's um, the bottom left picture is of me with a klezmer band based in Manchester, and occasionally I play for klezmer weddings. And then um, middle picture is me teaching klezmer because there are very few people that know how to play it. And uh, that's me teaching some students. And as I'm trying to explain what my life is around now, I'm obsessed with my cat, so I have to show you her. Her name is Arthur. And, uh, <laughs> and then the other side of my life that I decided to represent with the Reiki hands. Is, is a very important side of my life, which is about healing and spirituality and having an open heart and the kind of things that we all talk about at Truth Juice, um, without which I, my life would, really would be very different. And I discovered several years ago that actually I could do Reiki on myself and I'm really convinced that it saved my sanity and probably my life. So, next slide please. <laughs> So you're wondering why I'm showing me, it was about 11 years ago, and this was a peak experience holiday organised by a company called Bike Events, and I was really lucky to be able to go on this holiday. We had a van take all our tents and all our stuff around, and all we had to do was cycle over the Alps between Prague and Venice, and it was about 75 miles a day, and I got overtired. And one day, I forgot to put my helmet on, and I came off my bike. And that's what I looked like. And uh, yeah, it was pretty horrific. So I came off my bike um, somewhere down in the Alps. And next one. That's it. So basically, what I hadn't realized, this is 11 years ago, what I hadn't realized is that um, I'd actually uh, wedged my atlas, which is the top spinal bone in my neck. Um, conventional people didn't find it, a chiropractor did. Um, I've damaged my neck quite badly, 
and basically over the next three months after my accident, um, the pain got worse and worse and worse, and it actually felt like every second of the day I was re-experiencing my road traffic accident, and I was in so much pain I had no quality of life at all. And I have to admit, I'm sure there are others in the audience who've been in this place where they look okay, but actually they're not. And people around you, because you look like this, they can't believe that you're in really horrific pain. And you look so miserable, and you're so boring to be with, because all you can talk about is being ill and being in pain and suffering. So in the end, you drive everyone away. And all of us will have met someone like that. And I was one of those people. And I'm almost ashamed to say it, but there shouldn't be any shame in it at all when people are that ill. That's what happens, and that's a normal reaction to things that, that are invisible. So basically, in the end, I couldn't ask for help, because when I did, I was just so ashamed and so embarrassed because I looked okay. And people got fed up, and friends and family, and even medical people just drifted away. And I ended up um, spending eventually three years completely on my own with no social contact, and I lost all my self-confidence. I, I wasn't like this at all. I couldn't look people in the eye. And, uh, and no one would have guessed that I used to be a professional woman. And uh, in fact, you know, I think we all realise that it takes it happening, it happening to you to realise that no one is immune to horrific things happening in their life. There's no one is definitely going to get away with it. And prior to all this happening, I was actually a GP. And I was looking after people and I never ever thought in a million years anything like that would happen to me. And obviously no one's immune, so okay. Oh, I thought I'd just give you one highlight. I did have a highlight in those three years. Um, there was a, a whole fire crew of dishy firemen <laughs> who came to my flat when I nearly set it alight for the third time. And they came and fitted me an, an alarm, a smoke alarm, and that was nice, but the rest of it wasn't. <laughs> so, okay, on a hunch, I was obviously going to see my GP, and they were obviously prescribing stronger and stronger drugs, and none of them are working. And I was getting so ill from side effects from painkillers that weren't even working. So, on a hunch, I thought, okay, I, I couldn't play my violin, I'd hurt my neck too badly. So on a hunch, I thought, I need drums. There's something about drum beats I need. So, in fact, I managed to find a drum camp, and I managed to drive there, and God knows how. And when I was at that drum camp, from the moment people started playing the drums, my pain level went down and down and down and down, until it sat just about where I could cope with it. And I'd never ever had that experience with any drug I'd taken, with anything else. And because of the job I used to do, I was so gobsmacked that I'd never been taught that there are other things apart from drugs that are way more way more powerful. But as you can imagine, the amount of confidence I'd lost, there was no way I could walk into a medical person's surgery or someone who was interested in pain and say, hey. I've made this amazing discovery that may work for other people. So that's a little frustrating. Okay. Okay, that's it. That's all I, mean. um, I don't want to make this story too horrendous, but uh, I will tell you the bits about it that I think maybe are most important. There are, there are other aspects to this. But um, as I was quite unlucky, about 18 months after the accident, I then um, developed weird hearing in my left ear that got worse and worse and then the sound of an aeroplane engine that was really deep as if I was standing right next to it and music that I've loved all my life sounded like a horror, horror track and uh, no one really took it seriously until um, an old v nose and throat consultant I'd worked for which makes me really lucky referred me to London and they did some really special tests and discovered that I'd had a stroke so on top of developing this really damaged neck, I then had a stroke and I ended up so isolated because I've got this constant sound of an aeroplane engine. And if I give you an idea of what it's like to have, if people get tinnitus, they also have another thing 
that tends to happen at the same time. And it's called hyperacusis, which means overhearing, hyperacusis. And uh, if I just give you an idea of what that's like, if everyone's quiet for two seconds. So that level of noise would have been way too loud for me to tolerate. Even silence, even hearing my own voice. So, as you can imagine, that is pretty frightening, you know, to be on your own already because you're in pain, and then to develop a stroke. And so, here we go. So, I think this story has to take a turn for the better, because otherwise everyone's going to get depressed, including me, trying to remember this stuff. So, I was really fortunate because um, I found out about an organisation called the British Performing Arts Medical Trust. And what that is, is anyone who's a performer, an artist, a musician, if you develop an illness, they actually have special doctors that will see you and try to help you. So I went along to this appointment and I happened to meet a guy that had set up the first residential pain program in the UK. Now my GP hadn't heard of any of this. None of the local pain specialists knew about it or seemed to want to suggest it. So two years after the accident, with no quality of life, I ended up really lucky attending this four-week program. And the program was called INPUT, and INPUT stands for Inpatient Pain Management Unit, I think. Inpatient Pain Management Unit, yes. And that was at Guy's and St Thomas's Hospital in London. And I stayed there for four weeks. And what really surprised me was that the staff there had discovered that the conventional model of medicine that all of us know about, and there's quite a lot of negative talk about it in Truth Juice, and understandably so, they discover that if people have chronic pain, it doesn't work for them. That's no surprise, is it, really? And uh, what they did, they, amazingly so, for, it's an NHS programme, so they interviewed yoga teachers, alternative practitioners, people that knew about other ways of dealing with chronic illness. And they actually taught us how to do the things that alternative practitioners had learned to do. And that worked so much better. They also taught us not to take drugs for pain. Because if you're in pain for a long time, what it means is you take a drug the drug already stops you from being able to think straight. If you can't think straight, you can't do skilled things to help yourself. You can't distract yourself from pain. You also get side effects that make you iller. And there's this kind of catch-22 situation. So instead of that, for pain, we learned how to start off by exercising <coughs> just a little bit because most of us didn't move all day long. I got really fat, not attractive at all. And so basically they had to, a lot of us would just be in tears being shown how to do these exercises, saying, please don't make me, it'll hurt too much. So they did it in a very sensitive way, and they taught us how to do yoga stretches that are really quite skilled. And they taught us that far better than drugs is to find something in your life that you really love. And to be honest, I don't think this should apply to people with chronic illness just. I think it should be all of us. The thing that gives you quality of life is doing the thing that you really love to do. And I think it's the next slide. And this is a really skilled questionnaire. This, this is what they were asking us. I, I don't know any other clinic that would ask people these kind of questions. Usually the medical model says, what's wrong? How do we find an answer for it? But what if there's no cure? So at last they'd actually recognize with People with chronic pain, there usually isn't a cure, we're stuck with it. So this is far more skilled. So they ask questions like, what works to improve your quality of life? What works to distract you from when you're in pain or you're not very well? So what works to make you happy? What works so that you can socialize even on your bad days? And what works, what work could you do even on your bad days? This is a really boring answer. This was my answer. And I couldn't play music, and I couldn't hear it. But that was my answer. And to be quite honest, this little happy man up at the top, he's, he's uh, got his hand against something called a toolbox. 
And a toolbox is something a lot of people with chronic illness who go to, who learn about how to manage their chronic illnesses, get introduced to this concept of a toolbox. A toolbox is, is a set of skills that you discover work for you. So in other words, this talk is not saying if you've got pain you should do what I did. Completely not. It's saying what works for you. If you find something works for you in your life, if you're going through a bad place, you do more of it. If you find something makes things worse, you avoid it. If that includes people you love, you avoid them. Whatever. <laughs> Thank you, Lynn. She knows all about this. So basically, it means you do what works and you avoid what doesn't work for you. And you've got to do that in order to manage a bad situation. And it makes it so much better. Okay, that's it. Okay. Oh, there we go. Right, this is from my background. This is my training. This guy is a surgeon. Um, okay. So the NHS work in a conventional way. They respect something called the conventional model. And from my experience, the conventional model views people who are patients as being unskilled, disempowered, inferior. And I'm ashamed to say I recognize that. Uh, but in fact, really, in the conventional model, we're treated as relatively helpless. And what that means is that those people who manage to find other ways around different illnesses, the kind of things, the stories that we, we pass on to each other in Truth Juice, none of that will filter through to the medical people because they haven't got time to listen, they're not interested. And yet, you've got so many people in society that are brilliant role models for coping with different things that unfortunately the medical people ought to know about because they're the people who can disseminate information but that's not seeming to happen so it relies on groups like us to talk to each other about our experiences and pass things on the, the other thing is about the conventional model of medicine is that short term things they're called acute so if you've got an acute illness, it doesn't last very long, but it can be really bad. So if you've got acute pain, something like a painkiller can be brilliant. It can help sort that out and give you a lot of relief. But chronic illnesses, they're totally different. You can't keep on treating a chronic illness as an acute one for a week and then another acute one for a week for the rest of someone's life. Because what you're doing, you're poisoning people. Poisoning someone for a week to give them relief is okay, but not for a whole lifetime. And a lot of people aren't aware of that, but I suppose I've become aware of it. Okay. <coughs> right. So, as you can imagine, I was really missing my music. Um, I've been doing it since I was a kid, and it's my way, it's my spiritual thing. It's the thing that gives me a kind of sense of connection that other people get from going to church or... Know, meditating so that that it's that important to me and I was missing it so much so in fact at import what they said you've got to do your music if that's what is going to give you quality of life and in London the ENT ear nose and throat people said you've had a stroke you're frightened of music but you've got to expose yourself to music in order for your brain to relearn how music works so because I played a bit of guitar, and you can see I put on a bit of weight there, can't you? Wasn't very well at all. And so what in the little picture on the right, that shows me at a rainbow camp, I think it was Rainbow 2000 in Gloucestershire somewhere. And what it allowed me to do was to be with other people. I think it was a healing and detox camp. It allowed me to be with other people whilst I was trying to work out how music worked again. So I could put my fingers on a chord, I couldn't hear it, but my brain knew what I was supposed to be hearing. So that way, as long as I was around other people, I could teach myself what music was all about again. Right, so the other thing about needing to be around people with music was I thought, okay, um, I have several friends now who have disabilities and really serious ones. They're not patients, they're friends, they're on the level with me. 
And I saw pe other people like me who desperately wanted to do music. And uh, these two characters, Chris and Lisa, that's me in the background. Chris and Lisa have given permission for me to show their photos. And uh, we were given funding by David Blunkett's Community Champions Fund. And that was to cover the hire of the room and for someone else to set the equipment up because I was in too much pain to do that. And we'll see a picture of him later on playing guitar. Okay. How do I get to the, the internet site? I've got a quick, um, a quick snippet of sound beam just to show you how we did this music. Another way of playing the beam is to have a continuous run of notes to encourage music making in an improvisational style, such as here at the Cerebral Palsy Association College in Portugal, where sound beam is a key feature in this rock band. is Christopher from Loxheath near Southampton. He normally has a very short attention span and can be a challenging youngster, but here he reveals total concentration, an impressive sense of phrasing and real improvisational skill, an expressive and musical intelligence which was just waiting to be unlocked. Space in my life, 
Plain sand being is pure magic. Okay. okay, this is, if you imagine, you're 50 to 100 kids of junior school age, all with cerebral palsy and it's all quite bad. And you're at the National Conductive, en um, National Conductive Education Centre, um, which is that building in the Cannon Hill Park, if any of you know it. And uh, these kids had only ever concentrated for half an hour. It's back my concentration span usually. And uh, basically, in this in this concert, they saw two people in wheelchairs looking like themselves, who were part of a music group where they played an important part instead of being spoken down to, because we were all friends. And uh, they concentrated for an hour. And after that, two of the kids burst into tears. And, uh, I was saying to Lynn earlier on that, that actually could be construed negatively, not positively. But actually, they were they were really sad that we were going. So it was a really important experience for these young kids to see role models of people in wheelchairs with disabilities able to play music as an equal part of a music group. Okay. Right. So this is just to kind of reminds me. This is you know maybe not what I look like when I'm playing music. Uh, Lynn has seen me play my violin at K2 and mostly it's a jazz venue and she'll know I always look as miserable as thin when I'm playing my violin and unfortunately that isn't how I feel, I feel amazing, I, I'm just in an amazing place, the pain just, the, the moment I start playing I'm not in pain and uh, the look of concentration on my face makes me look miserable and I'm incredibly happy when I'm doing it. So this is kind of show you actually what's going on inside. <laughs> and the thing I've discovered, having worked with a lot of people playing music who, who otherwise wouldn't be able to, the thing I've discovered is that if you, if you are someone in a terrible place and you speak what is going on, you speak your grief and frustration and your sadness and your anger, it's a really great way of getting rid of everyone in the room. You, you lose your friends, you lose your family, you lose everyone's support. But the amazing thing about music is you play your grief, your anger, your frustration, your sadness. And everyone in the room is better for it. It doesn't matter how bad your emotions are. You put it through music and it's like this converter machine and it converts everything that's bad, you put into it and it comes out as magic. And that's the thing that I think about music. Okay, and I suppose the other thing to say is that this presentation isn't about a medical career. And it's not about being a professional musician. It's about the fact that there are people around, and I'm sure I'm not the only one, whose life hasn't been about climbing career ladders and trying to get financial gain and increase the amount of money in our banks. It really is just about survival and enjoying the day. Oh, that's me, but you can see me here already. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so this is just to say it took 11 years to get back to someone who could smile again. And uh, I've been so incredibly lucky with the help that I've been given by a few people, with some amazing friends. And I think if it wasn't for amazing people, anyone like me would still be down there and not here at all. There. Okay, I think this is really important. This is a really bad picture of one of my favourite places, and it's called Minat Theatre. You recognise it, don't you? Isn't it beautiful? Minat Theatre is kind of on the tip of Cornwall with the most beautiful views out to see. And people who live in Cornwall actually get to go to theatre performances and operas and whatnot with that kind of view. It's, kind of, it's a little bit like um, the outdoor theatre at the Mac, but with that view instead. Can you imagine how lucky they are? And I really think, you know, I, I really want to have a little bit more ambition for the future. But actually, I think sometimes it, the most important thing is not to be thinking of what you're going to be doing tomorrow and the next day in order to, to succeed. It's actually enjoying what we've got right here and right now. Okay, um, this is a little, this is the last slide. and. Uh, it's just kind of a, I just decided to put together what I'd like to be doing in the future. Um, the little box with the two seats on the left, that kind of depicts what it's like for me when I'm practicing music because 
otherwise I can be in a really bad place with pain. But when I'm playing my violin, even on my own in my office upstairs and learning music, I go into this place a little bit like meditation, and it's a really lovely, quiet, peaceful, pain-free place. Um, the middle slide is, um, I went um, swimming um, around coral reefs a few years ago, and I hadn't realised how beautiful and amazing an experience it was. And I really want to be well enough one day to go and do that again. Um, the picture on the right is a, a, a building in a place called Finthorn. Finthorn is a community in Scotland of people whose kind of principles are very much like truth juice. They, they consider things like sustainable living, care, taking care of one another, alternative ways of being well and keeping well, looking after the planet we live on. And I would just love to go there for a week or so. Um, the little candle's just about learning more healing ways, ways of healing, and maybe helping other people in a similar situation to myself who aren't quite so far on their journey. Um, the bottom pictures on the right are really just to say, I can't stop my music, because if I do, then I lose everything positive that I've gained from the last few years. And then, uh, yes, and I guess really, I would love to do some more cycling, because I haven't been able to walk that far. And I've suddenly discovered that having a really decent cycle means that I can get around and really enjoy the scenery and whatnot. <coughs> so, thank you so much for listening and being patient because it's always a little bit hard telling a, an emotive story. I never thought I'd be able to stand up and talk to people about what I've been through. I didn't honestly think I'd be alive now. So I'm just amazed and really thankful that I can actually do this and share a little bit of what I've been through with you. Thanks very much. Anything else I was going to say? Is, is, is there any questions? So on the healing side, so it's the music, is, is that the healing? Is that, is that you know, I think it's not just music, yeah. it's that's the thing that in my toolbox that works, works the most powerfully for me. And so you were just tapping into that and trying to build on that to, to gauge, you know, how did you gauge then the healing in yourself? All, all I know is if you are very ill and you do something that whilst you're doing it you don't feel ill, your body is getting relief. You're getting relief from it. It's giving your body a chance to heal itself. And I must admit, I've, I've become a I've become much bigger believer in, you know, our bodies have the ability to do what our bodies can do if we just get out of the way. So I think that's what I do, my way of getting out of the way letting things heal themselves. <coughs> I was just going to say, does, do you enjoy listening to music? And is that as healing to you as obviously you used to love listening to different types of cultural music? Um, so does listening to music now have any healing effects for you? Is it just the playing? More playing. So if, say, I go to a concert and I listen to other people, I can really love the music and I can find the pain coming back. So it's actually, it's about being totally immersed in something. It's, a, it's an interesting concept because um, I think you spend an average of 12 minutes in McDonald's and 6 minutes with the GP. That's a uh, time differential. So we're all, they're rushed, you know, they're rushed to give a quick diagnosis. Swift Climb Beach, and I think are richer than every country but 10 in the world. So you've got major medicinal companies funding doctors who've got 5 minutes of associated time to diagnose and get you out of there and get Mrs. McGinn's in because she's in every day. So I think, as I said, if you find your own distraction rather than an additional distraction, it's naturally going to be ethno-botanically better for you. But I suppose <coughs> the one thing I'm surprised no one said is how I feel about having been a doctor. <coughs> so you come along to Truth Juice and you know, um, and Actually, when I was a doctor, I, I realised these things, but not in as much depth as I do now. Yeah, but didn't I mean, all the best doctors used to advertise Lucky Strike. All the best dentists advertise the best use of fluoride. One dentist told a woman, Paul from Lester's wife the other day, don't wash toothpaste off your children's teeth overnight. Leave it on overnight so we can really get to work. <laughs> so he's not giving that from a negative point, he's giving it from. There was a program on Radio 4 recently, and it's where they're advocating that parents have their children 
have this fluoride coating that permanently stays on their teeth. Mm -hmm. well, you go along and it's like a varnish that they paint for the fluoride. And it was on Radio 4 about two weeks ago.